Hello everyone, this is Dylan from Hero Rhymes with Zero and this is a video about two big songwriting heroes of mine Kurt Cobain and John Lennon. I'm a songwriter and I'm interested in how songwriters work and how they use their influences and what goes into creating a great song. I thought it would be fun to have a look at the way Kurt and John wrote songs and to see if we can unpick any of the influences of John's writing style in Kurt's music. Kurt spoke of his love for the Beatles in a lot of interviews. He listened to their records when he was very young. Um, I read a biography of him by Charles Cross and his Aunt Mary gave him some early Beatles records when he was a kid. And there's a great quote in the movie about a son where Kurt said that he'd asked a friend, how successful do you think a band could be if they mixed really heavy Black Sabbath with the Beatles. So I think it was a mission statement for Kurt to incorporate, you know, pop melodies with his punk aesthetic. And, you know, he loved the Beatles and that was obviously something that he was thinking about right from the beginning. The Beatles are famous for the partnership of Lennon and McCartney. But having looked at the songs closely, I think that John Lennon is the predominant influence when it comes to Kurt's writing style and we'll play through some of the songs and look at the melodies and chord progressions and the wordplay in the lyrics and we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> it's just an opinion. Uh, so let's get geeky and look into what's going on musically that might have permeated into a young Kurt's mind. I should say that this is not a video about Kurt ripping off the Beatles. I don't think that Kurt ripped off the Beatles. I think that's uh, an absurd idea. You know, his songs come from a much broader spectrum of influences. There's obviously the whole punk scene, which is enormous in his life. And he had his own unique way of writing. And, you know, the Beatles is a very small part of that. But I think if we look carefully, you can see a bit of Lennon DNA. And as a songwriter myself, it's inspiring to see how other songwriters work. And it's fun. And that's all this video is. It's a bit of fun. It's highly subjective. And I'm just making it up as I go along. <laughs> so let's go for it. Here's Help by the Beatles. Um, a mono version for all you vinyl purists. Um, it's essentially a, a soundtrack album for the movie they made and side one contains songs from the film and side two contains some uh, you know bonus tracks or if you wanted to be uncharitable you might say they were album fillers and the second song It's Only Love on side two is, is a little pop song by John and I think it's really interesting especially when we think about the way that uh, Kurt wrote his melodies so let's have a, a I'll just play it like a verse and a chorus I get high when I see you go by my my when you sigh my my inside just flies butterfly why am I so shy when I'm beside you? It's only love and that is all. Why should I feel the way I do? It's only love and that is all. But it's so hard loving you. Is it right that you and I should fight and so on it just repeats the same structure to the end let's hear what Ian MacDonald has to say about this song Revolution in the Head by Ian MacDonald it's the best book about the uh, Beatles music and uh, it's so good I've got two copies <laughs> uh, this is what Ian thinks about It's Only Love it's uh, a twee make weight it's only love, embarrassed Lennon, probably written for another artist. The song is only slightly redeemed by its vigorous chorus, while the lyric is the hollowest Lennon ever perpetrated. His own estimate of it can be heard in his laughing delivery of the lines, 
Just the sight of you makes night time bright, very bright. And the song's original title, which gives an idea of how seriously its author took it, was That's a Nice Hat. Um, yeah, Ian's not impressed. So I, I agree with Ian that it's a bit of a throwaway song, but I don't think it's a bad song at all. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I think that John probably did write it quickly. But to me, that's fascinating because it's kind of unfiltered and there's something quite immediate about it, like he didn't think about it too hard, it just came out. And I think that when he says he was embarrassed about it, a part of me thinks that's because some of the lyrics are a little bit, you know, on the nose and um, it's a bit like that Jim Morrison quote that, uh, you know, when people are joking they're deadly serious and when they're serious it's usually pretty funny. So, um, you know, I think that some of the lines maybe disturbed him for being a little bit too honest. And so then he kind of trashed them. Uh, the melody, though, is really interesting, especially when we have a look at some of Kurt's stuff. So, I get high when I see you boom, bye. So in this one phrase, John manages to use these four adjacent semitones. And what that means is that at some point, the melody has deviated from the scale of the key of the song and it's I get high when I that B flat is not in it's not in the scale of C major and it doesn't sound particularly radical now but if you look at if you look through the early songs it's it's pretty unusual and uh, it's something that even, you know, Paul McCartney, who's always heralded as the kind of great melodist in the Beatles, he rarely does it. You know, when he's writing a, a verse, his melody lines, they're very appealing to the ear, and they will stick within the key of that section. He will modulate into new territory for his uh, middle eights or his choruses, but he will generally stick to the scale of the key of the song. Whereas John had a much more, I think he was uh, felt a little bit freer with his melodies or he just, because it, it's kind of punk in a way that he's not, he, he allows his melodies to sometimes include notes that you're not expecting because your ear is expecting everything to be in, you know, in a particular kind of harmonic world. And there's another great example from the early Beatles which is a song called It Won't Be Long, which is on the album With The Beatles. Hang on, I shall show you. With The Beatles, which is their second UK record. And I know that in the States they had these kind of weird issues. Um, they had an album called Meet The Beatles, which is a kind of a mix mash of singles and tracks from various albums. And It Won't Be Long is on the album Meet the Beatles, and I know that Kurt had that record because he said that he listened to it for three hours straight before he wrote about a girl. So this is a song that Kurt definitely knew, and uh, it's kind of hard to sing because it's really high, but I'll, I'll do a kind of Roy Orbison version. It won't be long, yeah, yeah. It won't be long, yeah. It won't be long, yeah, till I... so on. And again, if you listen to this verse, which is in E, every night when everybody has fun, he uses one, two, three, four, five, six adjacent um, semitones in his melody. So he starts in E, and then halfway through the phrase, he's singing notes from the scale of C. And again, it, it doesn't sound, we're quite used to this now, but I think it was pretty radical in this kind of setting of pop. 
And it's, again, it's unusual for songwriters to have their melodies, um, you know, veer around the kind of, I don't know what the, I'm not a trained musician, so I'm not entirely sure what the technical word is for it. I mean, it's just, it's a sense of not being so restricted and it's a sense of allowing the melody to do things that uh, are a bit surprising. And, you know, that makes it kind of really exciting. So I think once John had kind of figured this out or once, you know, it, it, he started to exploit it, he just completely ran with it. And by the time we get to his, you know, great, masterpieces he's doing it all the time so here's some examples of john doing some uh, melodic gymnastics is that the right word i don't think so let me take you down because i'm going to strawberry field nothing is real and nothing to get hung about Strawberry feels forever And this is one of my all-time favourites Half of what I say is meaningless But I say it just to reach you, June That one it's always just completely blows me away. That's just uh, that is a work of complete genius. Um, it's astonishing, and again, the melody completely free to move into new sort of territory from the original key and it's very pure and uh, it's it's <laughs> I mean that's a little bit that's that's almost intimidating if you're a songwriter that that's just kind of like oh my god I, didn't, I don't know where to start to get close to something like that but um, there's another thing about that as well which is the half of what I say is meaningless just keep that in mind um, when we talk about one of Kurt's songs later. And uh, there's, an, there's another example. Uh, yeah, I love... I'm not sure whether this one does necessarily do... I, I think it does. She's not a girl who misses much Oh yeah well acquainted with the touch of the velvet hand Like a lizard on a window pane The man in the crowd with the multicolored mirrors on his hobnail boots Lying with his eyes while his hands are busy working overtime Soap impression of his wife which he ate and donated to the National Trust But then, I thought, what, a, what an amazing piece of music. And there are little sections there as well where he's deviating. I think, not, not a girl who misses much. 
I wonder. No, girl. F sharp. Is that in A minor? I don't know. <laughs> right, one more thing, just for fun. Let's have a look at what Ian has to say about another Beatles song. So, back to Mr. McDonald. Let's see what he has to say about being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, which is uh, from the Beatles psychedelic masterpiece, Sgt. Pepper's. Ingeniously matching its serpentine C. Dorian melody, the lyric elaborates on its poster text with real wit, while with its irresistible image of a solemnly waltzing horse, the track as a whole offers a grotesque sequel to McCartney's wholesome Yellow Submarine, which only a professional misanthrope could fail to enjoy. Uh, yeah, you can often tell which tracks he likes by how much of a write-up they get, and being for the benefit of Mr. Kite gets a few paragraphs, so, you know, he thinks it's pretty good. Let's listen to a verse. <laughs> For the benefit of Mr. Kite, there will be a show tonight on trampoline. The Hendersons will all be there, later Pablo Funkers will want to see. Okay, hang on. Just listen to it one more time. For the benefit of Mr. Kite, there will be a show tonight on trampoline. I get high when I see you go by The Hendersons will dance and sing As Mr. Kite flies through the rain Don't be late Is it right that you and I should fight? It's practically identical. Um, and the chords are, again, there's a tiny variation, but uh, nothing too much. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a sign of how easy it is to not like a song because something annoys you about it. Um, but that underneath the, the lyrics or the production, you know, the, the actual bare bones of it, you know, often it's quite the same. Great. Now we can talk about Kurt. And we have to start with Nirvana's first studio album, Bleach, an absolutely brilliant record. Kurt's in a transition period here as a songwriter. Um, most of the songs on this record are guitar driven. You know, I get the impression that he was writing riffs on the guitar and sort of rhythmic parts on his guitar and that the melody lines were then following what he'd written on the guitar. So it's almost like the guitar is the voice in this record. Um, and a great example is just the first track, Blue. So let's hear a bit. <sighs> Yeah, you can see that the riffs come first, the sort of rhythmic parts. The vocal melody follows it perfectly. You've got this really cute little bluesy uh, riff in the verses. And the vocal just doubles it. Slightly reminds me of um, 
I need a fix cause I'm going down Down to the bits that I left up down. Which is also a bluesy riff that the vocal melody follows I think that's probably more coincidence than influence But um, that's, if you go on to the next song, Floyd the Barber, it's the same story You've got this really powerful, energetic, sort of dissonant intro but the guitar part is kind of dictating the way that the song will work. So, you, you know, I get the feeling that the guitar comes first and that then he's making his melodies fit the part that he's already written on the guitar. So you get to, you know, sort of this. Sadly, I cannot scream like Kurt. Um, again, the guitar comes first, the lyrics and the melody is almost there to serve what's been written on the guitar. I, I love that one though for the, the really dissonant chords that he's using and I get the feeling that he's beginning to experiment with finding melodies over chords that you know you wouldn't usually want to create pretty tunes over but you can sort of almost hear his mind going oh my god I can do this you know I can write over these unusual chords and I can create something great and you know that's all gonna come together on the next record um, the next song is about a girl which is always talked about as the kind of first real attempt that Kurt made at writing a Beatley number. That's now we're getting somewhere interesting. You've got the kind of naivety in the strumming that that's you know reminiscent of like the, the Vaselines and uh, you know some other jangly sort of beetle pop. There's a track called um, "Tell Me What You See," you know, and if you think about that and Molly's lips together, you know. This kind of sort of naive, it's beautiful rock and roll. You've just got this nice, simple strumming pattern, but then you have to construct a song on top. So with um, about a girl, he's just got to. There's no guitar riff there. He's just strumming away, and so he's forced to use his voice to find the melody, and it's a, a sort of a classic -y Beatles feel to it. Where he transitions into this next section, na, 
and I take advantage while wow. that's a really neat move because he's going from E minor and G and then he's going to you know C sharp and that's that's unusual and that's kind of clever so he's almost doing what I mentioned John does by sort of shifting and going somewhere unusual he's not doing it in the same phrase but he's managed to take the song somewhere new and you know he keeps the kind of nice sort of Beatles vibe going the whole way through so thinking about Meet the Beatles the album that uh, he listened to there isn't a song on that record called Not a Second Time by John and it begins with the same two chords which is uh, G and E minor in this case John plays it in the other direction. I'll just play a bit of Not A Second Time. You know you make me cry I see no use in wondering why I cry for you And now you change your mind I see no reason to change my Same old line. I'm wondering why you hurt me then. You're back again. Oh, 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 not a second time. What's interesting about this and about a girl, it's not so much that they share melody things. I mean, they've got the same rhythm, practically the same tempo, and the same opening chords. It's actually the structure. Not a second time doesn't have a chorus. He starts off with the you know you made me cry. There's that section, and then he moves into a neck the, the next refrain. He moves away from that those two chords to you're giving me the same old line. And you know Kurt follows the plan here exactly. He goes from the you know, uh, I need an easy friend to And I'll take advantage while So he moves into a new section, now he's taken it away from the verse and he needs to get back for the kind of payoff and that's where you get the But I can't see you every night free And John has the same problem when he's gone to the You're giving me the same old line He has to get back so you get the You're back again You hurt me then Oh, oh, oh Not a second time So it's a very classic pop structure There's not really a chorus You get the payoff line which is the Not a second time And in Kurt's case you get the I can't see you ever in night for free and it's just a really neat way of making the kind of perfect pop song. I think that people sort of were impressed and they thought, wow, you know, this kid can actually write a proper pop song. So there's something more going on. But in a way, you've got the, the sort of naive perfect pop song and then you've got the riff-based rock and roll, but the two haven't kind of melded together and that is what he managed to do in the next few years um, on Nevermind. So I was watching a documentary about code breakers at Bletchley Park in the UK. These were the people who were trying to crack the Germans Enigma code during the Second World War. And there was this old guy and he was talking about his experience working with Alan Turing, who's this you know amazing mathematician who's credited with inventing computers and he said Alan was a complete genius and I think the interviewer asks him well how how do you know what a genius is and he said well you know I was working with a lot of clever people and if somebody came up with a really smart idea or a great solution to the, the day's problem you know I think to myself that's an amazing idea but uh, you know I probably if I had enough time I probably could have come up with it myself because I'm really smart too he said, but every time Alan came up with an idea, it was just so 
out there and extraordinary that he would go, well, there's just no way I could ever come up with that because it's genius. And I, I think that's a pretty good uh, description of genius. So a riff like... That's a genius bit of guitar playing. Um, it's not complicated, it's not difficult to play. It's just so extraordinary to put those chords into a sequence. I was actually thinking, I wonder if, um, you know, because this is about John Lennon as well, I was thinking, I wonder if John's got a, a similarly amazing chord sequence. And I immediately thought of the intro to I Am The Walrus, because that also seems to shift through so many unexpected chords. But in fact, um, I Am The Walrus, I think it, it just descends. to the verse. I think that uh, lithium is is far more complex. But then the really astonishing thing is, on top of it, he manages to write, rather than following the guitar, which is what he was doing on Bleach, he writes this unbelievable melody. I'm so happy Cause today I found my friends in my head Maybe that's okay, cause so are you. Broke our news. And I mean, there's it's hard to know where to begin. It's really beautiful. It's almost like a, an English madrigal. You could imagine it being played on the harpsichord and you know, with minstrels. La 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 la. You know, it's, it sounds like it's from the 16th century. And that's not a bad thing, it just sounds timeless. The way that it's moving in and out of the sort of harmonic centre of the song reminds me... I get high when I see you go by it has that same Lennon quality that Ian MacDonald called it serpentine, which, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure he quite grasped how amazing and how sort of difficult it is to pull it off because it's, it, you, you're, you have to be so free to allow your mind to even imagine these things. And, you know, Kurt, by this stage, he's just, he's way ahead of everything you know he's he's creating these complex beautiful melodies that are weaving in and out of the key and you know they're just they're just brilliant basically and um you know nevermind's got two you know loads of examples of this happening it's it almost becomes like his signature there's a So here, I start this off without any words. I got so high, scratched till I bled. It's exactly the same. He's using notes that are in D. He's happy to play around with that. When you get to the, oh, I'm on a plane. It's a very signature thing that Kurtz, you know, has discovered. You know, he, this now is this isn't anything to do with John Lennon. Now he's decided, you know, to take these kind of slight dissonant choices, 
but to you know embellish them with harmonies and to make them the big hook of the song. Um, another example. If you want to, if you want to play this one uh, like Kurt, then you got to take off your sixth string, which I'm not going to do for the video. Polly wants a cracker I think I should get off her first I think she wants some water To put out the door to. Is me some sea Let me clear your dirty wings Let me take a ride with yourself Want some help, help myself Got some road, I have been told I promise you, haven't you Let me take a ride at yourself Want some help, help yourself So, in the chorus, by getting to that B flat That's what allows him to, you know, play the little trick and move the melody away from the kind of harmonic center point of the song. And you know that's uh, again it's I get high when I it's the same chord B flat, kind of completely irrelevant, but he's now he's just flying because he's able to pull these off in nearly every song. Breed has got a great similar melody line with a similar shift in it. Lounge Act, um, Drain You, that has the same serpentine melody weaving in and out of the keys. And uh, you know, in Bloom that's just a more straightforward kind of rock song, although it does have the, uh, it's, the guitar has, has a little, a similar kind of manoeuvre in it. Um, smells like Teen Spirit. Funnily enough, the melody doesn't actually. The melody is is another. It's another example of a, something that's almost like a madrigal. You know, you can. Um, da 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 da. It sounds ancient, which is to say, it sounds like something that's has lasted for five hundred years and will last for five hundred years. It doesn't actually shift away from the um, the central key of the song, but it's <laughs> it's brilliant anyway. Um, you know, so here I think it's just Kurt has ma has mastered the kind of collision of the punk and the Beatles thing, and he's taken it to completely completely new levels. He's really really flying, and you know that's why people just responded to the record and went, "Oh my God, it's incredible." Um, I did mention when I was talking about John, I mentioned that uh, little line from Julia. Half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Julia. It's incredibly powerful and Part of the reason it's powerful is because he's singing one note and it's almost as if the incredible painful memory of his mother and the fact that he has to almost retreat into this, in, this very personal space and that the only thing that he's able to articulate is this kind of one note, this one thought, this, you know, it's almost like a meditation, you know. And I don't think that Kurt borrowed that idea. I just think that it's fascinating that when he wrote something in the way, which is a similarly personal song, in that it's, you know, it's him sort of retreating to, if you read the biographies and so on, he's retreating to this space where he was incredibly lonely and feeling that he was being, you know, thrown around from family to family and he's also accessing this place that's 
so sort of deep that in a way the only thing that he can do as well is sing you know one note so you get the sort of you know I don't think that uh, I don't think at all that Kurtz borrowed or copied Julia. I just think it's really a kind of a beautiful coincidence that when they're both singing their most personal songs in terms of the kind of intensity of the feeling, that it's almost like the only way they can do it is is with this kind of one note that just cuts straight through and you know gets you. And it's uh, really powerful. So that's never mind. With <laughs> within utero, I don't really think that I want to say too much about it. I think that you have Bleach, where he's sort of learning to be a songwriter. You have never mind where he manages to pull off all of these incredible tricks, and really, he's like at the top of his game in terms of creating you know, the mission statement of combining the pop melody with the heavy Black Sabbath. He's done it. In fact, he's done it better than the, the sort of... He's taken the two components and he's smashed them together. He's made something new. It's absolutely brilliant. But obviously, there's still the feeling that it's a, it's a, a mixture. And that with In Utero, I think that that's when he finally made a record that was completely unique and personal and that, you know, the influences... Are, totally irrelevant by this point because it's a it's a such a strong artistic statement and that there's you know he's now operating on a on his own you know plane to to borrow a phrase um the only the only thing that i can remember thinking is that the song uh dumb reminds me a little bit of um bungalow bill but i'll let you figure out why i'm saying that <laughs> that's 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 a bit mean but um Hey, Bungalow Bill, oh, what did you kill? Now listen to Nirvana and see what you think. So, are there any lessons that anybody who's interested in songwriting can take from studying, you know, two really great, talented songwriters? And the answer is a big yes. There are definitely things that you can learn, and it's definitely worthwhile, you know, going through this process with writers that you also... Um, you know, admire and whose music you love. I mean, firstly, you know, you can be inspired and reassured. Um, Kurt and John, when they started, you know, when we discussed Bleach and some of the early Beatles music, they weren't, they, they were writing really good music, but it wasn't so tremendous. It wasn't so extraordinary that, uh, you know, it should be intimidating if you're starting out as a songwriter. I mean, they had unique voices and they had, you know, such presence and style. And those are different, those are different issues, that kind of star quality. But the songs themselves, they're good songs, but they're not incredible songs. You know, their great works came later on down the line. They had to find their own style of writing. They had to really work at their songwriting to get to that point. So, you know, don't be afraid of starting off with simple things and don't be afraid of just, you know, letting yourself write songs that you may think are not so great because they'll get better over time. That's, I guarantee it, they definitely will. The more you do it, the more you get used to the creative process. And the creative process with songwriting, it's actually, it's, a, it's about play, playfulness. And it's about playing in the same way that you played when you were a kid with Lego bricks. It's a similar kind of freedom of choice. You just have to allow yourself to put things together in, in novel ways and just sort of enjoy that process of trying new things and trying different chords and trying strange notes. There's no right or wrong. In fact, the wrong thing is often what will lead you to do something 
really interesting. You know, as we discussed a little bit here, I think that with Kurt and John, when they started going into sort of melodic territory that sounded a little bit uncomfortable or using chords that weren't quite usual, and, you know, Kurt especially, he loved to use sort of clashing chord sequences. You know, that's when his really great work started. And if you apply the same kind of freedom to your own experiments, you're going to get some really interesting results. Um, definitely just let things happen. Don't, you know, question them. When you're, when you're just writing, you just have to do the playing, play around with lots of, you know, ideas and just really get into this kind of like childlike place. And then if something kind of grabs you, then you get your, your phone out and you just record the little, the little moment that, you, that you've come up with and, you know, keep that for later. Um, I went through some of my own songs recently. I was thinking, well, I wonder if I've done any, I wonder if I've written anything that's, uh, you know, uses some of these techniques. I wonder if I've done it already, you know. And in fact, I was pleased to discover that I had. There's a song called Please Don't Lie that I wrote about 20 years ago. I'll play a little clip. I stay awake all night. Watch the sky long I wanna fix this empty inside Please don't lie Cause I don't think that I Could take this anymore How we know this love of mine And back again. Um, I was really pleased when I wrote that. Uh, it has a little section where it, it's, it starts off in a, in, a, in a sort of a minor scale and then halfway through the phrase you know introduces the major chord and it allowed me to just kind of swerve the melody a bit. I didn't plan to do it, I didn't set out to try and do it, it happened completely accidentally and I was <laughs> very thrilled with myself. I can remember at the time thinking, oh, this is the best thing I've ever written, you know. It's, it's, it's fantastic because I pulled off this kind of trick without even trying to do it. It had just happened. Um, there's a song that I wrote called Shaken Baby Syndrome. The lies that you have told me In these cases, I mean, I had the benefit of listening to their music, right, in my childhood. So it wasn't as if I had discovered anything new. I had heard them do it. So it was almost natural that I would find myself, you know, trying to do it or finding that when I did do something like that accidentally that I thought, wow, that's really great. I'll, I'll keep that idea. More recently, I've just finished making a record with my band, Every Kid Knows, and with this album, I really set out to try and write the perfect pop song. It was something that I thought, I've never really tried that before. I've never tried to kind of make a finely crafted, perfect pop song. So I had this idea, that's what I wanted to do. And I came up with a few kind of interesting writing strategies just to get started. There was a song, there's a song on the album, actually it's the first track, it's called I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream which is based on a, a great short story by a guy called Harlan Ellison, which I recommend reading. It's kind of freaky and really dark. Um, and for that song, here's a little clip.
for this song, I started with the first four chords of um, It's Only Love, which is the song that I started the video with. I get high when I see you go by. I've always been fascinated by this song. And I thought, well, if Lennon wrote a kind of a serpentine melody over these chords, I'll just use the same chords and see if I can come up with my own melody. Angel face, just wait a second while I hit this bass. Am I my limit? It's a real disgrace that I can't meet you there. You know I love the way up, and I was super pleased with that. All I did was, I got my four chords, I just played them for like an hour, just playing it over and over and over until, you know, my own kind of subconscious took over and I came up with the... And, you know, then when we recorded it, we gave it the full kind of, the full kind of Beatles, you know, with the beat and everything. And, uh, you know, later on there were some interesting chord changes as well. But the, I can remember the beginning of writing that song, I definitely thought, I'll just steal those chords. And that's a good idea. If, you, if there's a song that you really like, it doesn't have to be by Kurt or John. You know, find out what the chords are. If there's a particular grouping and you think that's interesting, just take them and then play them in your own way and let something happen that comes from you. It's not about trying to copy them as such, it's just having a kind of a little foothold that's a, a similar starting point. Um, there's another song on, on the Every Kid Knows record called Another Way. I was in France and I just had my little travel guitar and I came up with this... It's a kind of yellow like the moon It's a time when everything's too soon That was the first thing that I wrote and I was really happy with that. It kind of ascended in one scale, it came down in another. So I thought, that's neat, I'll keep that. Then I had a, another little melody that went ba -da 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 -ba -da -ba -da and I think that you know, a few years ago, I'd have just, I'd have just carried on singing that. I'd have, I'd have just played that bit to death. I'd have just, you know, repeated and repeated it, and thought, well, that's my chorus or that's my refrain. But I actually went to uh, the song on a plane, and I looked at it really carefully. And I had always really loved the fact that in his verse, I'll start this off without any words. I got so high, scratch till I bled. Love myself better. <laughs> the first two lines are the same. Da 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 na 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 na. And then he repeats that. And then the third time you get Not myself better than you And then back I thought that's really neat. It's like a call and response. It's it's a really sort of it's a perfect bit of pop. So when I was doing another way, I had the uh then I needed a new bit. Do you think that something is in your way? Monkey on my back, what is that you say? There has to be another way. And here it is in its recorded glory.
just stole it from, I stole the structure from Kurt. Well, stealing's not the right word. I just learnt it from him. I just went, okay, I've got one line. I repeat it twice. Then I'm going to write somewhere. I'm going to write another phrase that kind of is like a cool response thing. And that, you know, do you think that something is in your way? That was kind of craft. That wasn't, there was no inspiration there. I had to sort of sit down and go through lots of different chords and just kind of, you know, work through that um, in a slightly more, you know, self-conscious way. But uh, I think that, you know, if you follow that rule, inspiration first, then structure, then, you know, things are going to work out fine. And these two guys are just masters of well-structured pop songs, you know. So looking at the way the verses go into middle eights or that verses go into refrains or that the refrains then go into other little hooks, you know, Kurt on Nevermind. I mean, on a plane and, um, you know, smells like teen spirit. You could just analyse the way that he's going from verse to chorus to little hook to solo you could map it all out and then take your little ideas and just say right now I need to write this little section to fit in here and so on and that's a good way of coming up with a sort of a finely crafted pop song um, you know and as long as you don't feel that that whole process is kind of stopping you from expressing what you wanted to express in the first place it's fine I mean if you feel like it's kind of getting in the way or it's making you or it's coming out too much like Kurt, then obviously you need to bin it because um, it's not really about wanting to write songs like them. It's about wanting to write the best songs that you're able to write. So, um, okay, I think that's about the end of this video. It's a bit longer than I expected it would be. Um, let me know if if anybody's interested in me doing any others. There's a, I mean, I'd like to do Bob Dylan and Prince and, and Beck and there's a couple of writers that I'd really like to do films about if, if anybody's interested. I don't want to put any ads on this kind of video or anything. Apparently, uh, I was watching a video the other day by a YouTuber who does guitar tutorials and he was complaining about all the copyright claims. So I'm assuming that there's going to be all kinds of copyright claims on this video because I've played through so many Beatles songs and Nirvana songs. But... um. I don't really care about that and I also don't care if you subscribe because I'm not really into social media. So anyway, I hope you got something out of it. I had a lot of fun. Cheers.